Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second webinar for Precision University 2022. Today, we're going to be talking about sulfur and is it limiting yields on your farm? I would like to turn it over to our first presenter, which is Dr. Sean Castile. He is an associate professor of agronomy in the agronomy department at Purdue University. So Sean, we appreciate you joining us and he's going to talk about some of the research that he's done um, over in Indiana. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I'll go ahead and get my slides show up and make sure you guys, are we good to go with those? You guys see them? All right. Well, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk with you guys today. Um, you want to talk about, you know, the, the question at hand is, you know, uh, do soybeans need sulfur in, in terms of, you know, fertilizer applications? And, you know, obviously we've known for years that we've had decreases in amount of sulfur being deposited from the atmosphere. Uh, some of those telltale signs of where fields, you know, typically are going to be responsive. So I'm going to share a little bit of what we've been doing over the last number of years and to kind of work through that. Um, I'll stay online afterwards, too, if I don't address everything in, in the 20 minutes I have. So, so a number of things that come in, in line with this is, you know, it's a typical nutrient type talk, right? What are the sources? What are the timing? What rate? Um, and the other part of this, and the one that I think uh, myself and others in today's panel uh, will hit a little bit is, is the responsiveness. You know, it's, it's not going to be in every field, every situation, um, but boy, when we do see some of the responses, it's, it's very lively. Um, and some of these interactions that we've been starting to see, uh, nutrient interactions, as well as um, some synergy. So within 20 minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit of this, a little nugget of what we've been seeing. Um, I'm going to primarily talk from what I call my, my sandbox, if you will, my, my playground for soybeans and sulfur. Uh, the field and the areas of the state that I'm talking about, um, it is uh, coarse textured. It's a sandy loam, loamy sand type, but, but it's uh, what I call kind of a black sand. It's not truly sand, but it's on that edge. Um, it's a little over two, two and a half percent organic matter. So maybe a little bit higher than what we typically think of those low organic matter, coarse texture soils. But this is where I start in terms of, of dialing in different, different sources, timing and rates. And then we've built out across the state to say, okay, is this everywhere? And if it's not, where do we see it? So in that case, this is the, the type of field I'm talking about. So you can see off to the, let's see if I can get a laser working on here. Yep. So off here to the left is where my kind of traditional, if you will, over the last number of years, uh, granular AMS application is, is made. And so this is made as close to planting as possible. Sulfur is mobile in the soil. And so we want to make sure that's there while the, the plants are growing. I think that's one of the issues that we kind of talked about it. Once we identify fields that are responsive, um, how do we get it out there and, and how do we get it out there timely? I ideally would like to be going out there with a sulfur application when we're already putting out another nutrient. Um, but in this case, we're going as close to planting as possible because of some of the solubility. Uh, you can see off to the right, the tree to control. Um, the color differences, leaf uh, chlorophyll content, nutrients, uh, a lot of, of what's going on here is making 10 plus bushel responses in these responsive sites. Again, hear me loud and clear that there are certainly areas that don't see this, this response, even with our reference strip, if you will, of uh, granular AMS, 20 pounds of sulfur. So give or take, that's 83 pounds of product. If you are anywhere from that 80 to 100 pounds of granular AMS product, that's, uh, that's a good place to start to see if we have responses. Uh, I'm just pulling out a few of these in, in this time I have here of looking at sources. So 2018, this this is a nice set that uh, demonstrates how we're seeing some of the breakout based on sources back then. I did 20 pounds of sulfur. Uh, in the more recent years, I've cut it down to 15 to kind of weed out which sources are better. And again, this is at a, at a sulfur responsive site for soybeans. We spread it over the top after planting. And then 2018, we started with no XRP or uh, so phosphorus or potassium. So in this, this uh, lays out pretty well. Uh, untreated control, uh, 62 bushel beans. And then when we bring in granular AMS, so that 20 pounds of sulfur rate, the 10 bushel response. Mez 10, another product uh, that's got half elemental sulfur, half uh, ammonium sulfate, so that's soluble source. 
Uh, that's uh, been a really good uh, player for us. And maybe a little bit of oxidation with that elemental sulfur, certainly not going to all get oxidized in, in a single year. Pelletized gypsum, again, these are all at the same total sulfur rate. So whether they are in a soluble form or in total, uh, that's what we're shooting for. So these these three are pretty traditional, pretty commonly our, our top tier responders as far as sources on a field that is responsive. Um, so AMS, Mesden, and pelletized gypsum. This next tier, uh, KMAG, I anticipated when I first started this that this would be at the top, but it, it continues to be kind of the second tier. Uh, still responsive, but not, not as much. I think we may be getting some interplay with the, the magnesium there. Um, tiger, that's a, a source of pelletized elemental sulfur. Again, just making the point that it takes a lot of time. We're talking three, 400 days for an elemental source to truly get oxidized to the level that's available. So in a, a, an application at planting, we're just not seeing that oxidation. Uh, we did our own blending. The spray ATS, this is one I have been hopeful for. It's been kind of a mixed bag. Sometimes it's been as, at the top. Sometimes it's kind of the second tier like I have here. This is ammonium thiosulfate sprayed on the soil surface before emergence uh, without a herbicide. Ideally, it'd be nice to tank mix that but we, with a herbicide, but we do have some antagonism we have to work through uh, for that application. Uh, so seed size, so that's one of the major increases that we see with this. It's, uh, we have larger seeds uh, with this application. I think a lot of this goes down to our leaf retention. Uh, leaf retention is going down to a nitrogen supply. So um, protein, this is one of the few treatments that that we see an increase in yield, a sizable increase in yield, 10 plus bushel, as well as an increase in protein. Usually when we have an increase in yield, we have a decrease in protein because it, it costs the, the plant energy to, to produce that protein. So if it gets diverted to more dry matter than protein, then our yields go up. Well, in this case, we actually have both, that we have an increase in yield as well as protein. Uh, two of the amino acids that are sulfur-based are increasing with these applications. So again, in a, a sulfur-deficient situation, uh, these granular applications as close to planting, we've got kind of the top three, uh, granular AMS, AMS-10, and uh, pelletized gypsum. And then you do have some other sources that look pretty good. Uh, if you have any questions beyond that, I can certainly go into it. Um, here's what I'm kind of drawing to in terms of leaf retention later in the season. This example is an untreated control um, uh, early September versus 20 pounds of sulfur was applied at planting. We have this kind of long lasting effect, this leaf retention. And what that goes to is a nitrogen supply. And so a lot of questions I get on this sulfur topic is, uh, is it a sulfur response? Is it a nitrogen response? You know, nitrogen response from the fertilizer very little, um, occasionally maybe, but it's more a nitrogen response because of the sulfur's effect on nodulation. And, and here's an example of that. So untreated control off to the right in this picture where the nodulation is quite poor. Again, this is that same September day uh, versus the nodulation that you see with the granular AMS. So large number of nodules as well as the size. So when you have an adequate supply of nitrogen, you're gonna have better leaf retention later in the season, you're gonna have more pod retention as well and seed cells. So it's just this cascading effect that we see when we do have the sulfur response in soybeans. And, and primarily it, it really is that, uh, that sulfur is needed as a cofactor for nodulation, therefore supplying the, the needs of nitrogen. I think there is just some straight sulfur needs in, in that as well. So it's not all nodulation, but it is certainly a good portion of that. Uh, that, that comes into play. Sulfur also, with some of our soils and some, some of what you guys have as well, uh, helps with a little bit of micronutrient availability, manganese in particular. So I see uh, better manganese concentrations with our sulfur treatments. And so that kind of helps. There's a kind of multiplying effect of what's occurring here on those deficient sites. So let's go to a 2020 year with fertilizers at that lacrosse site. We've reduced the sulfur rate down to 15, again, trying to weed out which sources are better or not. Still at uh, over the top after planting before emergence. And in the recent years, we started balancing for the nitrogen, uh, the phosphorus and potassium. And so in that thing, we brought everything up to the same level. So 20 pounds of nitrogen from urea, uh, phosphorus wasn't 
provided. Uh, we added it to get the 60 pounds of P205 and then added uh, murate of potash, um, uh, so at 50 pounds of K2. So in this example, um, we have, again, some pretty sizable yield responses going from 51 bushels and change to the top tier AMS, MES 10, so another 12 bushel responder. This NPK, this starts to answer some of the questions that a lot of people have on, okay, is it a fertilizer nitrogen effect or not? But this also has phosphorus in it and potassium, so uh, maybe a few bushels, but I'm going to make a, a note just to ear tag this that We've had some issues with potassium applications close to planting of soybeans, especially when we're talking about the muriate of potash with the chloride. I've had this in high yield management studies and I've seen it pop up here and there. So I think we have to be cautious whenever we look at blending with the uh, potassium, potash in particular, muriate of potash, and so some of those effects. So uh, with that, uh, have our, our top tier sulfur fertilizers, AMS, MES-10, uh, sulfur 4, that's the pelletized gypsum source that I've used, still uh, quite good. And then we have a number of other products that are still turning that key. We brought in MES-15, even super sulfur, uh, some newer sulfur fertilizer products to, to look at this. So in short, if we're going to see responses or if you're going to look and see if you have responses to the sulfur in your soybeans. Um, I typically like to have reference strips out there. Uh, every field's not the same soil test. And we can kind of custom discuss how much uh, indication it may or may not give you based on thinking about the solubility of sulfur. But if we are going to look for sources and look for responsiveness using the plant to be our indicator, you know, if we're at least 15 to 20 pounds of sulfur uh, with a soluble source that's close to planting, I think that's a good starting point to see if you have the response. If you want to do it just uh, with a granular AMS, a lot of people say, well, let's just do 100 pounds of product. 24 pounds of sulfur is, is more than enough. There's no reason to go higher than that, but I've done rate responses with optimal timings and we as little as 10 pounds uh, gets it. But if you want a little cushion and then again, think about the timing of that application versus planting 15 to 20 pounds is certainly a good spot to start. AMS, MES-10, uh, that product or anything similar. Pelletized gypsum again are, are good sources. I wanna make a quick comment here as I, as I talk about gypsum. And, and thing that we need to put into context of our history of our field, right? So I know that there's been uh, a lot of work done in the idea of putting out gypsum just uh, in terms of soil health of bringing up calcium. Uh, and so some of those rates are, are more than uh, more than what we need for just sulfur alone. If that's got a history of it, that can kind of come into play whether we do or don't have responsiveness. Uh, if we've got um, animal operations and you've got a history of manure applications, so that's another source of sulfur. So whether we would see a response or not to some of these fertilizers come into what you've already done or what your clients have done on those fields. Second tier uh, fertilizers in terms of sulfur sources, ATS or ammonium thiosulfate, uh, KMAG are, are good options, but they just don't quite seem to be at the top. I have done some starter work here with ATS and I can address that later if there's any questions on it. If we're looking to just observe um, and use the plant as our indicator, uh, again, get close to these critical levels. And I would take leaf samples multiple times, certainly uh, when we come into flowering and early pod development, most recent mature leaves. If we're getting close to critical levels around 0.25% sulfur, uh, I think those are gonna be that indication. Again, it's, it's close, it's not a, a gospel. If you're at 0.27, it's probably gonna be a field that could be responsive to that. So just identifying those and watching that. And a lot of cases I've been seeing uh, more, more indication based on the nitrogen to sulfur ratio in the leaves themselves. So that same sample, if the nitrogen to sulfur ratio is 18 to one or higher, uh, basically it's in an imbalance or you can have responsiveness to a sulfur application. Those are gonna be fields that are gonna be ones to look at. I uh, alluded to this, and I do definitely want to at least share some of this. Um, we've looked at blending uh, so we can get out at one time, all right? And so blending with other other nutrients, and then also to answer that fertilizer nitrogen question alone versus uh, like a granular AMS. So we've set up trials where we looked at nitrogen alone. So it's urea, 17 and a half pounds of nitrogen, triple superphosphate providing 40 pounds of P2O5, and then murate of potash to provide 60 pounds of K2O and then in the combination. And then we've crossed those with 
uh, 20 pounds of sulfur. This is granular AMS. It's already providing the, the nitrogen source of 17 half pounds, and then we've added triple super, and we've added KCL or the, the combination. Again, trying to get the blend together, go across the field. So we're doing one application. I will note these are at planting. Um, so take that. Um, in 2019, when we did this, you first look at this setup. So we've got the column with no AMS, and we've got the column with, with AMS, so our sulfur sources, and then how much weather it had triple superphosphate or muriate of potash or, or the combination. In that, in 2019, we go from 50 bushel beans down to 45, a five bushel yield hit. Um, a lot of my high yield management trials where I put out you know, 60 to 120 units of K2O, I've been getting yield hits of thir three to five bushels with that potassium application. There's no doubt we need potassium and we need it in a major way. I think it's about the timing and what I'm drawing uh, a lot of these conclusions moving forward is the chloride effect uh, at planting. And so we're, we're exploring that. Uh, so that five bushel yield hit, I think a lot of this coming into chloride effect in terms of rooting and nodulation. Uh, and what drives me to that is whenever we start looking at, okay, we add in nitrogen and then we go back to 50 bushel beans. So we kind of erase or alleviate that. If we had brought in sulfur, uh, AMS, and now it goes back to 50 bushel beans. So we kind of fix that, if you will, but we don't gain anything. So it's kind of masking if there is a sulfur need in that crop. Uh, we saw that in 2019. Uh, in 2020, it didn't show up. So again, I want to share that this um, it's, it's situationally um, effective. So how much water, rain is moving through that chloride or not. Uh, so that can come into play. Um, again, we have some pretty large responses with the sulfur. In the three or four minutes, I want to get out of the sulfur deficient location, but also talk about, um, I'm going to skip a little bit on the chloride includers and excluder varieties. We can talk about that if you have questions. Um, I want to get into this high yield management, timely planting when we're seeing some of these sulfur responses outside of what you would typically think of. This is our prairie soils. This is 4% organic matter, and we're seeing sizable responses. And what I mean by that is sizable seven to 14 or even more 15, 16 double digit bushel responses. And what I wanna concentrate on today is just uh, AMS pre-emergence, uh, ATS pre-emergence. So these are 20 pounds of sulfur. Here's the Dakota spraying um, the pre-emerged ATS. Um, then we've got some in-season applications, but let's just live up here on this, these upper portions of, of really where this response will be. At the West Lafayette site, so our prairie soil, 4% organic matter, timely planted in that year, uh, May 11th, we had 62 bushel beans. And then we brought in any of these sulfur sources with the timely planting, we were up to nine bushel responses. The AMS, in this case, my turnkey, is about seven bushel responses. Uh, versus the first week of June. There's no differences when we look at these sulfur sources when we have those soils warm up. We think about mineralization, we think about nitrogen supply, we think about sulfur supply. So in this timely planting or high yield environment pushing that, maybe high residue or um, some of those cover crops come into play is what is limiting sulfur, even with high organic matter soils that we see responses. And so in 2018, we saw those responses uh, 2020, uh, 2019, excuse me, late planning. We did this study in June. There's no responses, just so you know. Um, but it goes back to, I think, a lot of the sulfur supply. So if we have uh, nutrients being supplied, sulfur when mineralization is not occurring at a fast rate, I think we're seeing sizable responses. In 2020, and this would be my last, so I can allow time for my colleagues here to speak. Uh, we brought in pelletized gypsum, pre-emerged 10 pounds of sulfur, and then 20 pounds of sulfur did not bring any, any nitrogen to the table. Want to kind of address this a little bit in terms of, is it a fertilizer nitrogen or is it a fertilizer sulfur effect? That's therefore affecting nodulation. So in 2020, remarkable responses again on these prairie soils. We go from 62 bushel beans, my referenced kind of AMS application, we go nearly 80 bushel beans, 18 bushel responses. I've looked every which way to make sure that we don't have wrong numbers to see these kind of responses on a prairie soil. Again, goes outside of the norm of where we think a sulfur responder is gonna be. Now we do have some middle ground to add in a little bit of nitrogen, maybe a little bit more, um, but I really think it's the sulfur 
uh, play. And, and what draws me to this is go down to the pelletized gypsum. We go 75, 76 bushel bean. So uh, that 16 bushel response with sulfur alone. You might say the, the nitrogen, fertilizer nitrogen might give a little bit, but by and large, it is the sulfur effect. And I think it really is on in the, the nodulation itself and then that sulfur supply. Once again, later plantings, first week of June, warmer soils, we are not seeing that response at all with any of the sulfur sources. So to wrap up, soluble sulfur for, uh, fertilizer, um, pre-emergence to early V stages, um, I think that has the greatest benefit and flexibility. Uh, 15 to 20 pounds, if you're gonna look at that, you can maybe go a little bit more, but I really don't think there's a need for it. If it's more of equipment's ability to spread, I understand it. AMS, medicine, pelletized gypsum are good sources. Uh, potentially some of the spray ATS can when it's done alone. Um, if you want to do a wait and see approach, take leaf samples multiple times and just see if you're in close to critical levels uh, and uh, 18 to one ratio or higher is a, a really starting point for me. Look at those interactions, the potential if you're blending with potash that you might not be seeing a sulfur response because you're correcting for a little bit of the chloride toxicity. Um, I have seen some promising results in blending with the phosphorus, uh, so be note of that. Timely planting, that is always foundational in our soybeans, high yielding soybeans, and then there's these situationally responsive sulfur sites when they're planted earlier, and those cooler soils limited mineralization. So with that, I'll be staying in line. Uh, Want to appreciate the support from Indiana Soybean Alliance and the United Soybean Board. So happy to answer any questions now or later. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I think we can do a couple questions now. Um, JD Bethel was asking if you've tried any side dress treatments with ATS and soybeans. Um, I think he's asking to incorporate that, what you shared look like sure. broadcast. Yes, so in terms of all of the, what I've shared today, it's all broadcast uh, prior to emergence. Uh, some of the, the 10 treatments in the planting date by uh, planting date by sulfur uh, was, let's see, I can go back down. Uh, I'll look at it later. Uh, we did spread some of V4 uh, over the top and saw some pretty decent responses. The vast majority of these uh, positive responses are gonna be in an earlier development. So then they, the sulfur can be used for nodulation. Side dress, like a uh, typical, you know, stream in, it in the middle, I, I really hesitate to say that there's gonna be much of a response because of the time it takes for the sulfur to get to the root system. I think you know, the spread is a better approach. I've done ATS in a starter. Uh, we did a two inch offset dribbled on top for the last three years. Uh, we have some, seen some decent responses. Those were done um, on our loam soils and our prairie soils was not done on our deficient, straight deficient soil. Um, in our prairie soil, we saw some pretty good benefit out of um, anywhere from four to 10 pounds of, of the liquid starter. So we've looked at KTS, ATS, and the Nature's product KFUSE, um, but it's not responsive enough to say that's every year. So in short, side dress, I don't think that's as good of a play. I think it's going to be better if we can do a, a starter or a broadcast. And if you're able to do the broadcast, not able to do the broadcast until you've planted, I'd rather plant timely and then get the sulfur out as quickly as they're thereafter. Um, so that's where I'm at on the starter, or excuse me, on the side dress. Okay. Um, have you seen an impact on soil pH with 15 pounds of sulfur versus gypsum? Uh, at 15 pounds, I mean, we've certainly taken soil samples, 15 pounds of sulfur. I mean, it's such a low, low rate uh, in terms of having a, a major effect with pH versus the, the calcium sulfate, so the pelletized gypsum. Again, that's a fairly low rate as well. So thinking about either side of that, uh, I think over the course of time, you could. Uh, one thing that has been interesting on, in terms of the pH effect is actually this rotation uh, we've been starting to look at some rotation effects from uh, starters, or excuse me, starters as well as side dress and corn. And in particular on the side dress with an ATS and corn, the following year, I've caught a number of sites where we've caught that band uh, in the soybean year and, and being responsive. I'm wondering how much of that is also, it's a, a side dress with ATS as well as UIN. So this localized pH effect, I wonder if we're having some of those um, pop through in comparison to, you know, like a 
uh, granular spread of, AT of AMS or pelletized gypsum. Okay, a um, couple more questions. I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to put up a poll question while we go through these. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so if you guys wouldn't mind answering that. And our next question is, does any sulfur persist for the following year crop from soybean plant residue? Yeah, so certainly soybeans are going to be taking up the sulfur. It's going to come into the plant. It's going to come in and get redistributed to the seeds as well as the stover. Um, what I, any part that's there, I go back to how sulfur interacts in the soil, and it's very mobile. So um, usually we're going to leach through what we have. And depending on the soils, when my time in North Carolina, we would catch uh, sulfur deficiencies early in the season, and then uh, they had a BT horizon that actually started to accumulate some of the sulfur. So, uh, and then we'd hit that with the roots and then they re recover. And so the, the answer with that, as far as, I think it's more of the residual question, maybe not as much just from the stover or the soybeans, but in terms of uh, the fertilizer that you've used and the sources. So if we've got one that's got like an elemental source, like a MES-10, I think we're gonna have some of that potential residual uh, if you've looked at elemental sulfur as building it up, and again, you've got soils that maybe have a horizon that could, could catch that, or you get that slower release, that's going to be that residual or rotation effect. Uh, I don't think there's going to be as much from the, the, the residue of the soybeans themselves, um, and as well as some of the soluble sources of sulfur, unless you go high rates. Okay, thanks, John. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. There are a few more questions, one in the chat and Q&A. Um, if you want to type those answers, you can, or we'll get to them at the end if you'd rather address them out loud. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our Next presenter is Lucelyn Floridor. She's a PhD student under Dr. Steve Coleman, who's our Associate Professor and State Specialist of Soil Fertility at Ohio State. Um, so she has been doing some work on sulfur for her PhD program. And um, Dr. Coleman is also here to help answer questions. So, Lucelyne, do you want to start your video and get started? We can see your screen. Okay. Well, hi, thank you for the introduction. Um, I am happy to be here and sharing the summary of um, crop responses to sulfur fertilization that we had in Ohio. I would like to first acknowledge my, my co-authors who have helped providing the, the data for, um, for this um, summary. So again, um, we are using um, previously conducted on-farm and on-station research trials that were conducted between 2013 and 2020 to um, to look at response of sulfur, we have data over 27 counties in Ohio and the shaded counties in the map are actually where those trials were conducted. We had 52 corn trials, 30 um, trials in soybean and, and 12 wheat. So in total, we had about almost 100, 100 studies looking at the response of um, sulfur application over one um, growing season. So each of the trial were, uh, was a randomized complete block design of two treatments, um, sulfur, one with sulfur, and the check or control with no sulfur application. They were each at least um, replicated three times. And then the plot sizes varied from 40 by 4,000 feet to small um, on-farm plot of 10 by 20 feet. Again, um, for our manipulation and, and other management practices were decided by farmers. So they varies across trials. And some of them reported malic-3 sulfur as um, 
baseline diagnosis back diagnosis prior to um, the software application. Some also report on R1 and, and grain sulfur concentration, but not all of the trials. Um, as sulfur sources and rate, this is a table showing the number of studies that we have and how many of them were using gypsum, ammonium sulfate, ammonium tile sulfate, or elemental sulfur as um, sulfur sources. And in parentheses is the rate of sulfur, pounds of sulfur per acre that were used by these um, trials. So um, majorly gypsum is probably the most commonly used source of um, sulfur in those trials. <clears throat> Out of the 52 total corn trials we have, 30 of them <clears throat> use gypsum at a pretty wide um, range from 20 to 720 pounds of sulfur per acre. And part of this huge um, range of gypsum is because of, um, as my colleague had mentioned, because of its um, dual use as a sulfur, as a soil conditioner. So people are adding gypsum for other soil um, physical benefits. Um, so we proceed to um, some data analysis, the field that were used in this um, compilation did not receive any software application or manual application for the past two, three years. And we did statistical analysis and look at significance at a p-value of 0.1 or less. And we also did some other calculations that will allow, like ease up the visualization of the data. So we, <clears throat> we calculate percent difference from control, which is the difference between the sulfur fertilized minus check for the given parameters, let's say is yield, <clears throat> let's say yield, and we divided this by check, and this gave us um, a percent increase or percent change in the parameter that we're looking at. Um, we also looked at relative yield, which is the ratio between the check and the software fertilized product, and that, <clears throat> and that tell us how much um, how much more um, is sulfur fertilized or the check, um, just a ratio between, between the two of them. So our question is how common are crop responses to sulfur? What are we seeing here in Ohio? So in terms of yield, um, this is a graph presenting the percent difference from control, as I mentioned how we did the calculation before. So each um, little dot, it's a trial, represent a corn trial, for instance. Um, and the, the bar is the arrow bar associated with that trial. And here is the, um, the average percent difference between the software fertilized and the control. Um, the dotted line is marking the zero line. So everything to the right of the dotted line is a positive sulfur response or a positive percent difference. And everything on the left of the dotted line is, an, is a negative percent difference. Again, this is just looking at um, uh, the percent change, not, not a statistical significance. Now to mark the, the statistical significance, we're using the little yellow um, red star is for statistical significance at a p-value of 0 0.1. So what we're seeing for yield response to sulfur fertilization in corn is very, very infrequent response. Out of the 52 studies, only two increased, um, only two were statistically significant in yield response. Overall, we had like if about a 40% um, positive response but not always significant, were um, statistically significant. And we also did some stati find some statistically significant decrease in, in corn yield. Um, I guess the same conclusion is valid for soybean. We did see a trend of more positive percent difference from control. It's about, um, may, I'll say perhaps a 60% um, positive response in, um, compared to the control, but again, very few statistical, statistically significant um, response to soybean corn yield, um, yield sorry. 
um, for wheat, we only had um, 12 trials in wheat, but again, we did not see any, any significant um, response to, um, to yield, to sulfur fertilization in wheat yield. Um, for the studies or the trials, we provided tissue sulfur concentration. The corn, like the R1, early reproductive stage for R1, the trifleaf for soybean or flag leaf. For the wheat, we did see a more positive percent difference from, um, from control. There's definitely an increase in a positive percent difference of um, R1 sulfur concentration in the, in, in the tissue. For corn, soybean, and wheat, mostly mustard, we on the right side of this dotted line, which, um, which, um, which means like there is a there is a most uh, a more positive response again to tissue sulfur concentration um, compared to yield. And um, for some of the studies that reported grain sulfur concentration too, we did see the same trend as in tissue sulfur concentration, a lot more positive um, response, percent difference response to sulfur concentration in, um, in all, almost all three, but corn and soybean are definitely more responsive than, than wheat. Um, this is just a table to summarize the significant responses we see to sulfur fertilization. Um, on the first, the this the column this column is from um, the component that we analyze. So we are mainly focused on grain yield, tissue sulfur, and grain sulfur concentration for each crop: corn, soybean, and wheat. And out of the fifty-two total observation in in grain yield, we did see two of the trial increased um, significantly, and three of them decreased significantly. And um, part of this is, again, goes back to, mon to management practices. Some of these trials, you tau sulfate as sulfur as um, starter, and we, um, we are uh, suggesting that we might get some um, burning or toxicity here for to early application. Um, for soybean, again, in, in grain yield, we did not see an overwhelming response. Only three of the trials were significant, um, significantly increased in yield, um, in yield out of the 30 that we analyzed. We also had some soybean trials that we have from this year that is not part of the data I'm presenting, but again, very few response of um, sulfur fertilization. Now, how effective are uh, our available sulfur diagnostic tools, what we usually use to see if a sulfur application is needed? So we look at the relationship between the relative yield and um, our typical sulfur diagnosis tool, with, which is the milk three sulfur, leaf sulfur, or grain sulfur, right? That's what dictated if we will we'll need or not a sulfur um, application. And looking at the relative yield, we did not see a strong link between the milk three sulfur for neither of the crop. So on this side, we have each crop, corn, soybean, and wheat. Those are the component of our diagnostic tools, the milk three sulfur, tissue sulfur, and, and grain sulfur. And these represent the relative yield. So we are looking at um, this data, and there's not really a strong relationship between the milk three sulfur, perhaps a little bit for the soybean between leaf sulfur and, and tissue, but um, not an overwhelming um, relationship here with the commonly used diagnostic tool for sulfur. So we're briefly looking at leaf sulfur correlation with um, grain, with corn grain yield on our raw data, just because tissue sulfur is typically used or is more frequently used as our diagnostic tool um, because of the variability of milk three sulfur from um, the soil. So we looked at this Pearson 
correlation. Well, I'm not presenting the coefficient here, but just to see the trend between leaf sulfur concentration and corn grain yield in general. So from the data we analyzed for corn and soybean, there's probably a more linear trend, but when we're looking at the data for wheat, it's definitely not telling us the same. So um, perhaps there is a relationship with, between leaf sulfur concentration and corn and grain yield for corn and soybean, but um, our data is not showing the same for wheat. So the sites where we did see a, res a, a response, and, and I'm referring to a grain yield response to sulfur concentration, were they all sandy, acidic, or any commonality between those sites? Because this is what we typically um, will expect a sulfur response from. So we looked at the characteristics of those sites where we did see a sulfur um, an increase in grain yield. And they were in different counties. We had some in Clark, um, Dark, um, Miami, and Wood County. So the organic matter in those sites were between 1.5 to 2.4. Uh, their soil pH, they were not really acidic soils. It ranged from 6, 608 to 6.73, and their CEC between 9 and 18. So um, it's really not typical to where, like if you look at the tri-state on where we could expect to see sulfur response, those sites are not typically what we would expect to see a sulfur response from, but we did see significant increase in yield from, from those sites. So our take home message is that yield response to sulfur fertilization rarely occurred in Ohio. We analyzed over almost 100 studies and did not see frequent response to, um, to sulfur fertilization in yield of either corn, corn um, soybean, or wheat. So sulfur fertilization more, more likely will increase your tissue and grain sulfur concentration, but not necessarily yield. Um, so I think it goes back to an economic decision on whether or not you want increase in tissue sulfur if you're not getting anything from yield. Um, also, the current diagnostics tools that we have, which are typically the malic 3 sulfur, tissue sulfur, or grain sulfur, in our case, have certainly failed to predict a sulfur response. Um, also, our statewide assessment suggests that sulfur mineralization currently might provide, um, provide enough sulfur to meet crop demand, at least, at least in Ohio, right? And that's probably why we're not seeing an, a response to additional software application. Um, with that, I think we have some more time for questions and, and, and comments. I don't know. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Luce Lane. Very interesting. Um, I do have a question for all three of you, maybe. Um, thoughts on you know, the response that Sean is seeing versus Ohio. Um, and I know our sulfur deposits typically came from acid rain because we we're closer to a lot of those facilities. Um, do you think that is what is helping us hold off sulfur deficiency or does it have more to do with our soil types? What do you guys think might be the difference between the two states? Well, I, I can jump in real quick. If you know, there's a, a national atmospheric deposition program that monitors um, weather station sulfur deposition rates. So that's how we know what's what's happened. It's um, net NA, NADP or something, National Atmospheric Deposition Network. And if you look at um, uh, what's happening, there's a few stations in Ohio. I'm not sure about Indiana. I know there's a few there. I'm not entirely sure where they're at. Probably West Lafayette, Sean, where you y'all you you are at. But um, there's some definite trends in terms of uh, Ohio being really still receiving a fair amount of deposition relative. It doesn't take long when you travel west for those deposition rates, those, those atmospheric deposition rates to decrease. And so I think, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about sulfur response and removal rate, um, you know, Luce Lane didn't show any of this data, but, you know, we've 
part of the tri-state revamp, we analyzed a lot of sol grain sulfur concentrations across lots of different trials. And, you know, 20 pounds is, uh, would be best case scenario in terms of removal rate, not total crop uptake, but removal rate. Typically, you know, crop removal with a, a reasonable corner soybean yield would be something closer to 10 pounds. And so if we've got a difference of maybe two or three or five pounds of sulfur deposition between Ohio and Indiana, that could be the difference between a response and not. Um, and, you know, I think that what, what we found here, at least, you know, across a lot of different counties, it's really site specific. And frustratingly, it's not, um, we don't have great tools or we don't have great capacity to predict when we're going to see a response or not. So it's, it, it is a bit of a conundrum in terms of you know, why uh, Sean's seeing the responses that he is. Um, and I, you know, I don't know uh, how, it, you know, of course the, the two approaches, we can appreciate the two approaches where Sean's done a lot more work with kind of trying to tease apart mechanisms of if it's nitrogen, if it's sulfur, if it's, you know, potash or, or P205. And here we're just kind of doing the, the shotgun approach of trying these on-farm, you know, pretty simple on-farm strip trials which um, just are doing a response versus not. So um, anyways, there's just some thoughts in terms of that question, but yeah. I'll, I'll add in and certainly the deposition, I pulled up the map and I don't know if we have time or not, but I mean, you, you guys have got, you know, now the three to four pounds roughly. And, you know, I made the comment that my, my turnkey on, on soybeans is um, just to look at it, 15 to 20 pounds of sulfur is more than enough. I did optimal timing and I only needed 10 pounds of sulfur with optimal timing. And so you put all that together, what Steve's talking about, you guys got another three to four pounds and then we put in any kind of field history, right? So if there is a little bit of the animal applications, so animal nerves, that's gonna come into play. Um, you look at the timing of uh, planting. I think that's, we've got to bring that in. It's one that a lot of us, we, we don't put in. Mineralization rates, uh, Lucin made a comment that you guys are more than adequate which I, I dare say that we are more than adequate depending on when we plant. And so I think that some of those tease out a little bit in this, these differences. Um, uh, again, I want you guys to hear loud and clear. I'm not seeing 15 bushel of soybean responses across the state of Indiana either. I mean, there's certainly those that I've got zero responses. And so I, I think that there is a lot of this predictability is, is very frustrating because I want to be able to see even seeing that everyone wants to say, yes, this is where you're going to do it and you're gonna see the response. But I think a lot of it is deposition and field history comes into play. All right, thank you guys. Um, do you have a poll question up? Which uh, crops are you seeing sulfur deficiencies in? And we have a few more questions for Sean. Um, let's see, Sean, it looked like you maybe started to type an answer to this, but I did, but then I want to listen to Lucine's presentation. So I did an answer. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, and I guess this could go to both, um, presenters. Would you expect, um, it was, um, typed during Sean's, but would you expect a similar response on clay soils? Uh, I'll let Steve and, and Lucine hit it and then I'll go from there. Yeah, uh, I, I'd say that, um, you know, we can use uh, kind of old adage from the 1995 tri-states in terms of where we might expect responses. And, and I don't take that, um, I mean, I think I take a lot of credence in terms of the amount of soil fertility work um, and the expertise that went into kind of the original crafting of that document in, in, the, in the 90s. And, you know, at that time, of course, deposition rates were much greater than they are now. Uh, we, we know that, I mean, just in the last 10 years, software deposition rates have, have, have been cut in half, really, in, in Ohio, at least. And, um, and so it was sandy and acidic and particularly cold soils. That's where we saw responses, according to tri-states. And so um, clay soils, are we going to see them? Uh, yes or no? I mean, um, the old tri-states would say uh, likely not, but you know we've certainly seen, it depends on your definition of what a clay soil is, right? And where you're at in the state, but we certainly have seen uh, positive responses as Lucene, Lucene showed, certainly with, with Sean's uh, prairie data, it's like 
I don't know how clay those soils are, but anyways, high CEC and heavier soils yep. are uh, are not exempt, right? We know that that there's a uh, certainly a potential of seeing responses on clay soils as well. Yep. Right, and I appreciate that. the The point with the clay soil, and I, I started, and I don't want to get into because it, it, there's nuances to that, right? And so organic matter that's associated with clay soils. I've got some fields in the southeastern part of Indiana that. I mean, they're clay soils, but the, the depth to the BC horizon, that's making a huge difference in our responsiveness. We see sulfur responses on those that are shallower soil. So I've maybe I took a soil core uh, auger down and we're at 36 inches to BC versus the spot that is not a highlighter green. It's nice dark green, uh, no response to sulfur, and it's just a little bit deeper. And so it's still a clay soil, which is about, I think a lot of it is the water and that comes into play and in creating an environment where we have limited sulfur supply, limited nitrogen where on the soybeans, and we've got some uh, corn trials there that are responsive. It's a clay soil, but it's about some of that water logging aspect and how does that affect turnover microbial activity. Um, I'll also say that I've got some a little further Southeast, so near the Ohio, Side, I call my crawdad soils, and so where an inch of rain is like four inches of rain, and so again, you're saturating that profile, it's not draining. So, I, I think some of those come into play to see a sulfur response or not. Okay, so uh, Melvin had a question um, on weed control. And he realizes you guys aren't experts, but are there any thoughts on using ATS as a herbicide carrier in soybean burn down application? Any possible negative herbicide in, um, interactions with ATS? Any experience with yeah, that? I'll, I'll go ahead and hit that. I'll go ahead and hit that one. Uh, so that was one of my hopes was that just let's go with uh, when we see responses, let's go with a trip that we're going across the field. Uh, ATS seemed like a perfect uh, area to go, especially with burn down ahead of soybeans. Um, uh, Bill Johnson at the Weed Science guys, they did a little bit of greenhouse screening. So there is some antagonism. Glyphosate's the one in particular that comes to my mind. And so there is some antagonism with greenhouse screening uh, with ATS. Now, if I recall, they did one and a half gallons of ATS and seven gallons of ATS. Um, so at seven gallons, that's, that's a pretty high rate. Uh, so I, I think that we need to kind of loosen that up, come down a little bit, and there could be the potential of still getting the sulfur need. But uh, I think we have to be mindful of what, what weeds we're going after. And it can be overcome, if I recall, that some of their work in uh, bringing in a different chemistry to help with that or increasing the rate. Again, to my recollection, this was the glyphosate side of things. So the, the increase at the, you know, nearly two quarts to, to overcome any of that antagonism. I personally have not done those interactions and also looked at, do we have the sulfur soybean effect? But there is that option, but I really hesitate until you know what you're going after and you know the potential uh, negative effects of that antagonism or herbicide tank mix. John, let's uh, jump to you real quick. Um, he was originally on our agenda, um, but just wants to make a few comments about a sulfur trial that he had this uh, past year. Yeah, so just to kind of round things off for everyone, first, we appreciate uh, Steve and Lucille and, and, and Sean being on and making some good comments. And, and uh, you know, I just I kind of want to bring to the forefront that um, some of the work we did in 2021 around S with several growers across a few counties. And, and as mentioned, it's it's kind of a mixed bag and results for everyone. And so I would encourage people, you know, a couple of points to make here is I would encourage you to be doing some of your own farm, you know, do some on farm research uh, and kind of seeing for based on your practices and your fertility program, you know, do you see response in corn and soybeans? And I say that in both ways. I'll tell you in 2021, I was just looking through several of mine, you know, we really didn't see much response in, in soybeans, you know, in the central part of the state here on our projects uh, within the soybeans, but we got to see in a few, you know, a couple places, some response from in corn. And, uh, you know, real quick on characterizing that, those were high yielding uh, situations where we actually saw a response. And uh, I was just doing some of the math, um, you know, at a, uh, in the S ratio of 10 to one was kind of optimum on that. So if I'm putting down around 200 pounds of N, 
we're basically looking at about 20 pounds of S and that was either put down right at planting or, or somewhere in, around side dress. Again, that's for corn. My point in all that is, is in, we saw you know a few studies where even in corn, there wasn't any response. So I think it's still specific. I think you still need to learn for yourself and your practices and your farm operation to see what works and what doesn't. And so get with us or, or others and, and we'd love to help and, and be part, you know, participate in doing some research with you. So, uh, but anyways, I, don't, I just wanna say good comments by our uh, presenters today. Um, and uh, I'll turn it back to you, Amanda, to, to kind of finish things off. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, and thank you to all of you who attended today. Um, thank you to our speakers, a lot of good information. Uh, we understand this is a topic on a lot of people's minds. Okay, just a reminder to join us next month for Ag Tech Tuesdays. Uh, several presentations on eFields uh, results. And other upcoming programs include our weed universities and the soil health webinars. Um, we just had one last week and we've got two more planned coming up. At crops.osu.edu for other um, events around the state that our agronomy team is hosting. And the 2021 eField report is available. You can see the link there where you can um, look at it online and be sure to pick up a paper copy as you come to some of our in-person programs this year. Precision Agri-Services, Inc. Since 1994, Precision Agri-Services, Inc. has provided the best agronomic, environmental, ag technology, planter services, and planter products to farmers and agribusinesses. For more info, visit precisionagriservices.com.